We are at the Palazzo Te in Mantova, a true chamber of wonders of the Italian Renaissance. It will be my privilege now to share with you some of the most interesting aspects of its very, very eccentric architecture. Let us go inside. The Palazzo Te was the residence of Federico II Gonzaga, Marquis of Mantua, from 1500 to 1540. The name comes not from tea, but rather from the fact that it stands on what was known as the Isola del Teietto, an island surrounded by Mantua's circumscribing lakes. Originally merely the place where the family kept its horses, the palazzo was to become something far greater, a true locus of political power and discussion where Gonzaga entertained important dignitaries and figures from the past. Construction began in 1524 and took over a decade. The building is the brainchild of the Italian architect Giulio Romano, whom we can see here in an astounding painting by none other than Tiziano himself. Romano was the most gifted student of Raphael and quickly distinguished himself when the latter died in 1520. Four years later, he accepted the invitation of Gonzaga to come to Mantova. The palazzo features a number of connecting chambers that have all been decorated according to a program set forth by Romano, a program spanning three main rooms. The room of the horses, with what we might call portraits of Gonzaga's equine champions. The room of Psyche and Cupid, that tells the story of the two immortal lovers as set forth in the golden asp at Apuleius, and the redoubtable Room of the Giants, which I will show you in the end. However, the most interesting aspect of the palazzo's design is, in my opinion, the thematic correspondences between the inside and the outside the architecture and the frescoes it contains, and how it manages to convey a sense of fear and anxiety that has been commented by a number of art historians such as Gombrich. Let us go outside to see how this actually works. The Palazzo Te is conceived as locus amenus, that is, a pleasant place. Isabel d'Este actually described it as a place surrounded by water where we go to take the light. As such, it takes advantage of the natural existence of water around Mantova and incorporates this into the architectural design. However, I believe that Giulio Romano actually wanted to play with this to create an anxiety around water. Let us remind ourselves that in the Renaissance, the management of water was very, very difficult. We have only to think about the catastrophic inundations pro produced by the Tiber in Rome to realize that water is very threatening. And I believe that Giulio Romano makes uh, reference to this in this very part of the palazzo. As we can see here, these archways over the water appear to be almost half flooded. Indeed, there is a sense of urgency, of fear. The water level is rising, and all soon shall be destroyed. But, can we find this at place somewhere else in the building? In the inner courtyard of the main building, we can see some other aspects of this anxiety, this architectural anxiety that is manifest in some very eccentric aspects of the architecture. Here, for example, we can see broken pediments. So the pediment is split into two and appears to be falling away. There is another, uh, another example of this at the very top in the frieze because we can see metopes and triglyphs are alternating and the triglyph is sunken, giving an impression of imminent collapse. There is a third element to this, that very, very specific stone that seems to be coming out and is uh, treated with rustication also appears to be on the verge of collapsing. Apart from the arches over the pond, these elements have been widely discussed by scholars. But there is one more thing to consider that I have not seen mentioned in the relevant literature. Let us talk of rustication. In the Renaissance, it was a type of rough-hewn finish given to stone that spoke of luxury. It was very expensive, in fact, and as such usually featured in the private palazzi of rich families. But in the Palazzo Te, rustication is used in a specific architectural element where we usually do not encounter it. Let us go into the entrance of the palace just to see what I mean. As we can see, the columns have been treated with this technique. In this case, rustication seems to me to convey upon these columns an air of instability. They seem old and even structurally unsound. Let us now go into the room of the giants, where it all comes together. 
The Stanza dei Giganti is undoubtedly the most impressive part of the palazzo. It depicts the Gigantomachy, the war between Olympians and the giants who sought to conquer Olympus. With extreme pathos, the gods hurl thunderbolts downward and the giants experience doomsday. When visiting it for the life of the painters, Giorgio Vasari said that whoever enters that room and sees the windows, doors and all so forth distorted and apparently hurtling down cannot but fear that everything will crash down upon him. Indeed, all the contemporary visitors spoke about how it appears to have no end. It just goes on and on. Furthermore, according to Caravel, Romano constructed the floor from actual stones and merged them into the ones he had painted at the fresco's lower edges, thus affecting the viewer's physical equilibrium. My theory is that what we experience outside the palazzo, with the crumbling architecture we have discussed, is indeed the very same fortune that the giants have encountered. With the Olympians on the ceiling and the giants on the walls, Romano seems to ask us to identify ourselves with the vanquished. A final detail bears mention. In the entire palazzo, the only architectural order that is used is the Tuscan. The only time we see the composite order is in painted architecture, specifically in the crumbling painted architecture that builds the giant's homes. What is Romano saying with this? Let us consider that the composite order is the most refined, the most civilized, perhaps the most arrogant of them all. Upon Olympus, the gods have their own columns. They are ionic in nature. But man, in his hubris, seeks to outdo them, and thus must be punished with destruction. Inside this room, as outside of it, Romano seems to point to the fact that our most magnificent works of art or architecture are doomed to be destroyed. Being a poet, I could hardly refrain from composing a sonnet. Here it is. Meanwhile, above our woe in clouds of light, the Olympians perched in joy deign to observe a world of shadows we cannot deserve, where hunger, war, and horrors crowd the night. They look and wonder at our every pain, oft sympathizing, often not. Perhaps they think we suffer what we ought, but what's to them? They thunder us in vain. For here the flesh is ripped, yet born the heart, and here the spirits given to the seas, we are beset by trouble, they eclipse, and yet it's here that flourishes true art. How jealous they must be, the gods they smart, for only on earth will flourish beauty and art.